Now, we all know that the NFL is a cutthroat business and it's hard to keep the feelings out of it. But sometimes they just leak through. And in Patrick Queen's case, it seems like it is exactly what happened. He, of course, was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens in the first round of 2020. And he played with the Ravens for four years and then he had his fifth year option decline. And then instead of going to a lot of other teams around the league, he had 31 other options. He decided that he wanted to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers, that they made him the best offer. But what happened with Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh? Well, we've talked about it before, but Patrick Queen, he brought it up again because he was speaking to the media. And we're going to go over exactly what he had to say because now this game just got that much more personal. Team, keep it clean before we get into it. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, turn your notifications on, and leave a like on the video. I, oh, I know y'all about to go crazy with it today. I know y'all are. So, without further ado, let's just get straight into it. So, of course, Patrick Queen, um, him, current Pittsburgh Steelers, they gave him the best offer. But what happened with him and the Baltimore Ravens? What happened with that relationship? Patrick Queen said the following. Um, this came from Brooke Pryor, who covers the Pittsburgh Steelers. She said, linebacker Patrick Queen was introspective, talking about the emotions of playing his former team this week. And in that, he revealed that the Ravens didn't offer him a contract as he was hitting free agency. So, um, we remember, like, we, we, we heard that before, that they didn't offer him a contract. But, see, what makes it even worse, it, it, again, it's a business, but feelings get involved. If somebody tells you one thing, that can sound great. I remember Eric DaCosta said, hey, we want Patrick Queen on this team. We want to keep Patrick Queen. We want him to be a Baltimore Raven. But... If they didn't offer him anything, then that can make you feel like, oh, some kind of way. Because it's like, man, he's saying that this out in the public. He wants to keep me. He wants me to be around. But they didn't even make me an offer. Oh, boy. But anyway, Patrick Queen said he has not talked to John Harbaugh or general manager Eric DaCosta since he finished playing with the Ravens. So that exit, the interview, that locker room exit, that locker room clean out. Once he did that, that was a wrap was nothing not a word now that's tough because it's business it's business and if you wanted to be somewhere you wanted to be with that team you wanted to stick around you wanted to hang around and be a part of what they were gonna do and that can hurt that can hurt big time so you could tell like this this game means a lot of extra for pq but continuing she also said that patrick queen said on the ravens i wasn't wanted back i didn't get an offer back it's definitely kind of upsetting being there for four years, the bond that you grow with your teammates. At the end of the day, the first few months, you definitely go through those feelings. So Patrick Queen letting it be known, like, look, those are my brothers. And he was somebody that was well-liked in the locker room. And I feel like a lot of Ravens fans, they uh, underappreciated Patrick Queen, especially when they've been seeing his former Batman, so when he was called Robin or uh, Roquan Smith and how he's been this year, a lot of Ravens fans are like, man, wish we would have kept Patrick Queen. Wish we could have kept Patrick Queen. And look, I was somebody, I wanted them to keep Patrick Queen. But you know me, I wanted them to keep everybody. But Patrick Queen, he has certainly continued to get better and better and better. We know the beginning of his year started off a bit shaky, but he continued to improve. And the year that they, dra not drafted, excuse me, the year they traded for Roquan Smith, Patrick Queen had been doing better before Roquan Smith had even got there. But then when Roquan Smith got there, that made him even better. And those two, they end up developing a bond and the chemistry, and it was amazing to watch those two. And then last year, too, us, oh, man, it was great. But they both went their separate ways. Of course, Roquan staying with the Ravens. He wasn't going nowhere. Uh, but Ravens had signed him to a $100 million deal. He was averaging 20 mil per year for his deal. And Patrick Queen ended up going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. But we already knew. Once they traded for Roquan Smith, we all should have known it was over for Patrick Queen at that point. Because they don't trade for a linebacker, especially a, a starting linebacker of Roquan Smith's caliber, if you're doing everything that they want you to do. If, if you're everything that they envision you to be for their team, they wouldn't have made that move. So that let us know right there that Patrick Queen's time, it was ticking. And I was actually surprised with Patrick Queen because I thought that he was going to request a trade out. When they traded for Roquan Smith, I was like, yeah, okay, even if, if he finishes the year with the Ravens, cool. But I, I definitely think he's going to request a trade out of the Ravens next year. I could definitely see it happening. But he didn't. Well, not to my knowledge, he didn't. But he stuck around, and it worked out. Um, but now he's over there in Pittsburgh, and he's been doing his thing. Um, but you know, like, 
I, I could see Patrick Queen really pressing in this game, really doing everything and more uh, to make sure that he makes some plays against that Baltimore Ravens offense. But, <laughs> ooh, Ravens got something for you and somebody who is number 22. Because in order to defeat the Queen, we got to make a king come through. Now we've reached my favorite part of these videos where we get to feature your questions. Before we get into it, if you would like to be a part of it, you can send me an email at teamkeepitclean at gmail.com or for the Team Keep It Clean patrons, you can send it directly on Patreon. Shout out to the, the little mirror angle. At first I was like, you know what? I ain't gonna have a mirror in a video, but I was like, you know what? Whatever, this is a little something different. It may be a little distracting, but it is what it is. Anyway, uh, first question came from a Team Keep It Clean patron, my guy Keontae. He said, what's good and great? I wanted to give some of the newer people a chance to put questions in. Uh, I was on a roll. Nice to hear from the new Team Keep It Clean crew and some of their concerns. Now, to the nitty gritty. I hate the fire hardball chance that keep recirculating. We got to realize perfection tapes takes time. Blaming Harbaugh for the defense is crazy because along with Orr, we have four new coaches, Doug Mallory, DB coach, Dennis Johnson, D-line coach, and Mark DeLeon, inside linebackers coach, who have to all work together to create the defensive perfection we want to see Orr. Well, we want to see. Orr has the keys to the defense, but he doesn't have as much help as McDonald did last year, who, by the way, passing and rushing defense is ranked in the bottom half of the league without the superstar cast from a year ago. What I'm getting at is Harbs assembled the dream team last year. It took a bit, uh, took a little bit to realize it, and it's taking longer this this year, but greatness comes from adversity, and I'm confident in Hobbs and Orr, given we are working with a new crew. But my question is, out of new acquisitions we have, who has a better game, Johnson or White? I'm leaning Johnson, uh, winning us the game because we know Ravens are on are the biggest trolls. And the way Tomlin made it seem, he isn't worried about the wide receiver that he saw a lot of potential in when he drafted him. What are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, you know, like, Ravens are trolls. They are going to do some stuff to try to get Deontay Johnson involved. Ravens are very, very petty with stuff like that. And if they going against somebody who used to play for that team, they are going to do not necessarily everything and more to make sure they get involved, but they're going to do a whole lot. So expect Deontay Johnson to get a good amount of snaps and a good amount of targets too. Next question came from another team. He patient, my guy Derek. He said, Greg, what's going on with you, man? I just want to come out and say, I apologize for being so pessimistic about our Ravens, man. We all say things, th things in frustration. I love the Ravens no matter what, man. This is a Super Bowl squad. Just a few repairs. Well, a lot of repairs with our secondary. It's all good, man. Don't apologize for that. But anyway, he said, what changes do you think will be made before the game against Pittsburgh? Do you see Chris Hewitt being replaced maybe because George Pickens concerns me, uh, but he doesn't scare me quite like the guy in Cincinnati, uh, in which I'm about to mention. So engraving in 2021, I remember I came across a page that was giving updates. All the first round rookie wide receivers from 2021, how they were currently doing in the rookie year. I believe it was midway through the mid-November mark. They said Jalen Waddle has a high ceiling. Great speed will make a fantastic number one if he works on his route running. Devontae Smith will be another great wide receiver. The route running is there. Just gain more weight without slowing down. Kadarius Tony needs to show the same thing he did at Florida, catching the ball and creating separation, and then he'll have more playing time. And Rashad Bateman shows flashes of who he is, great hands and separation. He just needs to not let bad health get in the way. And guess what they said about, you know, Jamar Chase. They said Jamar Chase divine lol that's all man uh what are your thoughts on everything i said i hope you and the wife have a blessed day and the kids and dogs as well appreciate that well they were right they were spot on about jamal chase that man is the truth um situation is big though too he played in college with joe burrow uh then he ended up getting drafted to joe burrow's team so that is a perfect scenario for him jamal chase is one of the people who's just amazing so i'm sure anywhere that he went he would have been amazing but it helps that a guy that you played a lot of college ball with you get drafted to where he's playing at as well well, as far as any changes that we could see from the Ravens defense, um, hopefully they just play more man defense, I would say. Uh, play more man defense um, and just it's going to be a physical game. Um, but hopefully the pass rush with Travis Jones being back again, the the pass rush should be able to take. Not, I don't even want to say take another step. I mean, they could, but just it's all about consistency now. So if they can just have consistency, then the Ravens should be in good shape. Next question also came from another team, Keeping Patriots. He said, one thing I like to see the Ravens do is more eye formation. I absolutely love it when I use when I use that play in Madden uh, before corporate greed ruined the game. It was always a go-to play for me. Another thing I love about the eye formation is the Ravens are one of the only teams to still use a fullback. So the opposing team can really practice against, can't really practice uh, against a fullback because they don't use one. I'm sure they put an extra lineman back there or something, but they ain't no Pat Ricard. Uh, that's a good point because, yeah, a lot of teams don't have a fullback these days. He said, I haven't sent a comment in since before the trade deadline. We didn't get any significant help in the secondary, so now all we can do is root for the guys out there and hope that they figure it out. I know Marlon said it wasn't a coaching issue but a player's issue. I really don't think that's the case because how do we go from first and everything to dead last and everything? Well, not dead last and run defense. Uh, he said, that's a significant jump backwards. I can see it maybe being the players if they jump from first to 16th, but they didn't. They jumped from first to 32. Second, there's literally isn't a worse secondary than ours. Not the Panthers.
Panthers, not the Patriots, not the Titans, not the Raiders, not the Giants, not the Cowboys. All of these bad or middling teams, uh, and you are behind those guys. I mean, come on, you're worse than the Panthers. How come on third down they always get the first down? But why does nobody ever pick up the running backs on the check down? It's it's frustrating. It's a crazy thing, and I I don't even know, but they they gotta figure it out. Defense again. Next question came from my guy Eli. He said, "Shout out from Vancouver, Washington. Appreciate you, Eli." He said, "Hope you and your family are doing well." I'm so confused on why we are so trash at defending the pass this year. I know Hamilton went down with that injury, but man, it's hard to watch these games. Last few years, if we lost, it was most likely because we gave up turnovers on the offensive side, and now that our offense is on fire, our defense fell off. Uh, but I will say, Marlowe has been playing a lot better this year than he has in the past. We just need the rest of the guys to lock in. Yes. Easier said than done, but you are spot on. We need everybody else to come through, too. Next question came from my guy, E9. He said, Hey, Graven, hope you and the family are doing well. I've been watching your visits as usual, and your concern for the defense is real. I think it's all of our concern. He said, I just checked the stats from last season, and in 2023, the Ravens have allowed six rushing touchdowns for 1,860 yards and 18 receiving touchdowns for 3,263 yards for the entire season. So far in 10 games in 2024, we have already allowed seven rushing touchdowns for 730 yards. Oh. And 22 receiving touchdowns for 2,949 yards. Wow. So just 300 yards less than the entire last year already in 10 games this year? Oh, he said, why? I wanted to get your thoughts on the issue, and I'm going to use general everyday work experience as the analogy for my question, so please bear with me. In a typical everyday job, if a top-performing department in an organization has a manager that leaves the company and moves on for a better opportunity, a la Mike McDonald, he or she is replaced by a current shift supervisor, Zach Orr. Uh, the staff basically remains the same, minus PQ, Geno Stone, and Clowney, but productivity and quality in the department drops off significantly be putting the entire company at risk is it because a the new manager is trying too hard to put his own stamp on things and refuses to follow the old manager's proven plan that could be part of it because what what's been the biggest the biggest change has been zach or he's t- taking over the defense and then the, there have been a lot of other p- position coach changes too but he's been the, the biggest change and I, I remember going into this season like, oh, yeah, the defense, they should pretty much be the same. They, they, they got pretty much the same people. They did lose some significant guys like a Jadavion Clowney, like a Geno Stone, like a Patrick Queen. But they should be straight. Um, and, and the defense, yeah, he'll put his own stamp on things, but it'll pretty much be the same defense. He ain't going to fix something that's not broken. Wrong. Anyway, he said, B, his subordinates think of this as an opportunity to make changes of their own without consulting him. Oh, so you saying players going rogue. Ooh. He says, see, he doesn't have the respect of his subordinates because he was once one of the boys. I actually feel like that can give you more respect if you were one of the boys. Because a lot of times, and I know me before when working like a more normal job, I would like the managers who had been where I was at before because they could relate more. If, if a manager had never done what I was doing, then I'd be like, oh, they, they, they don't really get it. But I feel like you can relate more if somebody's done what you've done. He said, D, the personnel losses we suffered were more significant than first believed. Stone and PQ cover the middle just saying, A, yeah, that too. So I, I'm going to say A, B, and D. So all of those. Uh, he said, I could be 100% off base, but I'm having a hard time believing our secondary forgot how to play pass defense. I've seen plenty of NFL defenses have busted plays here and there, but those guys were still closer to the offensive player uh, than our guys have been this season. Yeah, guys be wide open every game. He said, thanks for always taking my questions and reading through my rambling thoughts. And like the Ravens secondary when it comes to covering Jamar Chase, I'm out. <laughs> Next question came from my guy, Sean. He said, Peace and Graven, I'm going to try to keep this short and keep it a buck. In my opinion, I believe Zach Orr sh- should put the first round draft pick, Nate Wiggins, in the spot of Brandon Stevens. I agree. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with you at all. Like, it, what's, the, what's the worst that could happen right now? Uh, he said, To me, uh, he has shown to be an island at times. He was at Clemson. He has growing pains like any other first round pick would, but they get thrown into the fire every season. In my opinion, it's hard to do worse than Brandon Stevens. It's very clear that Marcus Williams will not and refuses to play for Zach Orr. Ooh, that's interesting because of the last question that my guy Enonic just said. He said, none of us are behind the scenes, but we have eyes, and it's clear to see something happen, and Marcus refuses uh, to play. Marcus Williams was a top three safety two years ago when he arrived in Baltimore. No player falls off the face of the earth when you are that level of player. Body language says a lot, and anybody that watches the film can see he's just taking up space on the field and refuses to even attempt to make plays. He's the third highest hit, so him and the family are okay. Uh, I'm not feeling Zach, so minus injury and play, I'm a millionaire. Now, when Marcus Williams was benched, I don't believe he had a problem with sitting on the sideline. None of the position swaps were work this late in the season so it's safe to say we just have a hole at free safety oh man that's that's scary i oh that's that's scary he said hope you and the family are doing well until next time one love that's a very interesting thing right there that's an interesting point i um now you got me wanting to look at the the games a little bit more in detail and look at marcus williams and the body language a lot more uh next time we watch the game so let's see what happens against these pittsburgh Steelers. but i'm gonna be thinking about that in the back of my head Got a clean house. Next question came from my guy Rodney. He said, what's good, Mr. Clean? 
this guy said. Anyway, he said, uh, bro, thanks for reading my last email. I talked about signing Xavier Howard and Frank Clark, but Jamal Adams is a free agent also. Hmm. Also, we should look at a running zone on a wide receiver one side and man on the other side. Uh, I, I would say no to that because they're going to get confused. They already get confused doing zone on both sides and man on both sides. So they're going to get even more confused doing one on one side and one on the other. I, I just, I don't know, man. I mean, you know what? I actually, at this point, it couldn't hurt. They could try it out and see what happens. Uh, as far as Jamal Adams, uh, do we need another linebacker? Could he be a coverage linebacker? Maybe. But anyway, he said, great if his disguise is right. Can't play man on wide receiver ones. Remember, Chase put up 260 plus and three touchdowns. Can't rock that. Now, when they played man, because um, I remember Ryan Ming posted it. When they played man, Chase Burrow, I'm, Chase Burrow, I mean, pretty much Chase Burrow, but uh, Jamar Chase, he got a lot. He did still get one touchdown in man, but a lot less yards. And Joe Burrow was a lot worse against man than against zone. And against zone, he ate us up. But against man, it was not. He was not like that. So, yeah, I, I would say more man than zone. You can play man. You just need some help for us, especially receivers like Jamar Chase. MV3, next question came from my guy Oreo Cookie. He said, Dang, Raven, hope your day is going well. People are confident that Lamar will get his third MVP, but I'm scared of two reasons holding that back. I have confidence Lamar will keep this pace, but voter fatigue is a real thing. And two, if the Chiefs go undefeated, I'm afraid they will vote for Patrick Mahomes to be the MVP simply due to them going undefeated. What are your thoughts? And just like the Ravens' defensive game plan, I'm out. Voter fatigue is real. We know that. Um, but I still think, well, Lamar, like, you look at Lamar. Look at everything he's doing. He's the best player in the world right now. Obviously the best quarterback right now in the league, but the best player in the world. So you, you, can't, you can't have voter fatigue if this player right here, he's already surpassed what he done last season, what he did last season, stats-wise. He's already surpassed that. So he, he, threw all, he threw 24 touchdowns last year and I think, what, seven interceptions? Um, but this year, he's already thrown 24 touchdowns to two interceptions. And then two interceptions on the game is his fault. But anyway, it, it's football. It's part of the game. It happens. So he's already surpassed that passing-wise. He just he, – I think he surpassed his rushing yards, too, from last year. So I, I feel like voter fatigue, it, it can't be a thing if he's surpassing what he did last year. 